move into our speaker this evening. Instead of being, you know, telling everybody how awesome Brian is because he's totally awesome, um, I want to give you guys a little story about him. So when Brian was 10 years old, he used to go and visit his grandparents at that lived about two hours north of San Francisco. They lived on a vineyard, and what, looked, what he looked forward to most was digging in the wind pile and hunting for frogs and lizards. And this is just what 10-year-old boys do. One particular hot summer day, Brian was digging and digging and couldn't find anything until finally he uncovered a single buried frog deep in the wood pile. He immediately grabbed him, and I'm just assuming it was a him, and ran around the carport where he found one of those red metal Folgers cans. Brian took the hose, filled the can up with water, and then dropped in his new friend. The frog took one stroke and then froze. He froze in an extended position like Superman flying. Brian sat and stared at the frog, trying to figure out what was going on. And when he reached to pick him up, and he understood immediately, the hose had been sitting in the hot sun all day, and the water in the can was just hot enough to kill the frog. I'd like to welcome today Brian Singer. Thank you for that. Um, for the record, uh, I love frogs. That's me on the right. Yeah, I didn't really mean to kill the frog. Um, <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Um, I thought I'd start this evening by giving you just sort of a brief uh, background on myself. Um, my name is Brian Singer. I uh, am the principal of a design firm in San Francisco called Altitude. Uh, I'm the former president of the San Francisco chapter of AIGA, and I am the creator of the 1000 Journals Project. Um, I went to school at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, which is sort of midpoint between San Francisco and LA. Um, it's not known as one of those design school titans, but uh, has graduated a fair number of talented folks. Um, and then moved back up to the Bay Area where I worked for uh, any number of design firms. I sort of hopped around a lot, um, most of which you've probably never heard of and don't even care about. But the most notable would be uh, Jennifer Morla. Um, I freelanced at Pentagram, Chen Design, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, and so forth. About uh, seven years ago, um, I started Altitude and uh, have since, it's right there. That should totally work. All right, we'll do that. Um, since starting Altitude, I've had the pleasure of working with such folks as uh, Apple, Adidas, Chronicle Books, um, everyone from uh, large uh, consumer brands to small tech startups to arts organizations and cultural institutions. Um, we don't specialize in anything at Altitude, meaning we don't have, uh, we don't do just interactive or just annual reports. Instead, we try to focus on that big picture idea and let that strategy drive what actually gets created. Um, in everything, though, that we do, we try to bring it all back to this one idea, and that is that the future of marketing isn't really marketing. You know, we're, it, it's time to give people something they want, something that makes them smile. This is something they can have ownership over, something they can participate in, uh, something that they're not going to throw in the trash. So I'm sure you all know this, but we're living in an age where um, we are being inundated with more messages now than ever before in history. And I'm not just talking about television advertising and billboards and direct mail and internet advertising and product placement and those creepy people that hang out at bars trying to get you to buy a Bacardi Mojito. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about email and text messages and Facebook and Twitter feeds and Foursquare and all of these things that are sort of continually vying for our attention. So it's getting tougher and tougher for companies and ourselves to actually break through all that clutter and build meaningful relationships with either our consumers, our friends, or people we want to sort of champion our messages. So <clears throat> with this in mind, uh, we believe that the way to break through all this is by engaging people through inspiration. Now, I'm assuming everyone, in, or most of the people in the crowd, are coming from some sort of creative field. Um, can I see a show of hands? How many people ha are students in the audience? OK, and how many people are five or more years into their career? OK, so it's a good mix. So these students, you guys are lucky because you haven't experienced this yet. Um, but you will. Um, at some point in your career, um, you're going to get burnt out. And for me, it was five years in. I hit that wall where I, I was actually designing annual reports and really did not want to go into work the next day. And I think when we get to that point when the job that we wanted to love really sucks and you just can't get up out of bed in the morning and go do it, you need those things on the side, those things that inspire you to keep your creative juices flowing. So that's really what this talk is about, is those things that are on the side that keep you sort of creatively inspired. So throughout the talk, I want you to think about what actually inspires you. For all of us, it's going to be something a little bit different. Um, 
Some people have personal interests. It could be gardening or cooking or NASCAR. Um, for others, it's self-authorship. They want to be the voice in control of things. Maybe you write a blog. Maybe you publish your own zine. Maybe you want to write that great American novel. Um, for others, it's going to be fine art. Uh, fine art is how I was suckered into the graphic design industry. Um, in high school, I loved doing art, and it seemed like graphic design was the way to make a career out of that. Turns out they're not the same career, um, but that's how I got in. And then the idea is that these things that inspire us in the outside world will sort of keep us inspired in our day-to-day -day work and hopefully filter through to our professional work. The goal being that someday that you will go to work and the work that you're doing will inspire you. Um, I'm still working on it, but I think I've got a plan. So I'm going to share some projects with you that um, happened sort of outside of the studio environment and um, based on things that have inspired me. And I moved to San Francisco in 2000. And when I moved there, the first thing I noticed was the telephone poles. And I don't know if you guys have this, this here, but um, people used to use telephone poles as pu public bulletin boards. So they'd staple flyers to them, lost dog, garage sale, my band is playing, and so forth. And over time, years and years of these things getting stapled and the weather wearing at them and the staples rusting, they just become these graveyards of like past events and little bits of tidbits of typography and so forth. So I started going around and pulling the stuff off. Um, it's actually kind of painful because there's a lot of rusty staples you have to remove. And uh, at this particular outing, this is a great shot because uh, the police came by four times but didn't, uh, didn't stop once. They just kind of wanted to see what I was doing. And you get lots of uh, blisters doing this. But after I get the paper off and remove the staples, it then gets sorted into little bins because everything has to be organized and categorized. Um, and then what I do with it is I make collage work. So this is sort of the fine art side of things for me that keeps me inspired. Um, I take these old flyers, um, tear them up and reassemble them into sort of graphic structures, very simple shapes but very uh, complex. Um, and it ranges from sort of art panels uh, to 3D pieces and so forth. So this sort of um, rediscovery of art, this rediscovery of what I really, really enjoyed doing, um, led me to start producing more and more pieces. And uh, I was actually invited by Target to do a commission for them. So I actually got to create um, three 30 inch by 30 inch panels for their corporate collection. So this is a photo of me working on it, uh, and then sort of how it looks as you drive into the details. And this is how it looks installed in their, uh, in their space. So this sort of, um, I think me rediscovering the love of why I got into graphic design, the fine art side of things, um, led me to all sorts of other explorations. And one of the things I started uh, looking into was, you know, we, we deal a lot with language and I started looking into word frequency. So I'm not sure how many of you know this, but the Bible mentions unicorns nine times. Um, so I started, I did a piece called Nine Unicorns, and what they are is the pages of different Bibles uh, crossed out except for the instance of the word unicorns. Um, and this interest in word frequency also led me to believe, well, if there's nine unicorns in the Bible, what else is in there? Um, so I've been doing these sort of word pairings and this is just a quick uh, video of an entire Bible that I actually um, whited out the entire text of, except for the instances of the word uh, love and the word evil.
that video, actually the original version is 30 minutes long. Um, this is the short version for you guys. Um, and, and this also led me into looking to other word pairings. Um, these are panels that were created kind of like a, a merge between the crossing out and the tearing up and reassembling of things. So each of these panels is again 30 inches by 30 inches. Um, and this piece is called uh, Knowledge 172 Wrath 198. And so there's 172 instances of the word knowledge in the Bible and 198 instances of the word wrath. And so the panels are essentially um, crossed out, torn up, and then reassembled. At the beginning of this year, um, it was announced that uh, a publisher was going to be republishing uh, Mark Twain's uh, historic novel, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And this is one of the most banned books of all time, and they were going to republish it uh, minus the N-word, because that's what the big controversy is about, is the uh, sort of racial um, slurs in the book. And uh, so my response to that was to take an old version of the book and actually cross out the entire thing except for the 212 times the N-words used. So it's called 212 Slaves. So that's the fine art side of things. That's sort of my rediscovery of the love of art has sort of kept me going when I have to sit at the office and do really, really boring work. Um, I'm also inspired by current events, and this is great because this current event is still current, but it started about two years ago when the economy took a digger. Um, it struck me that when, when politicians talk about the economy, they always say something like, we have to do this because it's good for the economy. We can't do that because it's bad for the economy. And they're never really saying we have to do this because it's good for people, or we can't do that because it's bad for people. So it led me to question, what's the, why are we always concerned so much about the economy and we never mention what's good or bad for people? So I did a series based on that, um, because obesity is good for the economy. Nature is bad for the economy. Crime is good for the economy. In California, it's a multi-billion dollar private industry. I think it's about $40,000 a year of taxpayer money goes to keep somebody inc incarcerated. Um, how many people carpool here tonight? Show of hands. Shame on you. Carpooling is bad for the economy. Um, debt is good for the economy. And self-esteem is bad for the economy. If we all felt good about ourselves, we might not need all those shiny new things. So um, this obviously takes the form of uh, panels that were created, but also uh, stickers, which got sent out to, I don't know, 28 countries or something. I had a thing on my website, and then people started sending in requests, and I had to shut it down because it was too much. But uh, people started sending in photos of where these things have been placed in their countries, which is great because when they make it out into the public, cart pulling by a parking meter and crime. And I just happened to bring some of the stickers tonight, so if you want some afterwards, I've got some up front. Um, I'm inspired by individuals. Uh, I'm, I'm in a different office now, but my last office was um, right next to a freeway overpass on uh, Folsom Street near 2nd in San Francisco. And every day walking to the office, you'd walk underneath this overpass. And every day walking underneath this overpass, there was a homeless guy. Um, an old man uh, had a blue blanket always listening to a radio, reading a book, or smoking a cigarette. He had his shopping cart next to him. But he was there every day when I walked into the office, and he was there every day when I left, until the day that he wasn't. And I literally walked into the office that day, and I was like, our homeless guy is gone. Like, our homeless guy is gone. And it struck me as that in San Francisco, there's homelessness has been on the rise because of the economy and everything. And um, it becomes easier and easier when you see something every day for it to sort of fade into the backdrop of the city. You get so used to panhandlers and homeless people and someone passed out on the sidewalk that you just start ignoring them. You know, they're just like, oh, yeah, no, I saw that before. Um, and that sort of bugged me because it had happened to me. I mean, this guy was there every day and he just sort of became part of the wallpaper until the day he was gone. I'm like, what happened? And suddenly I was concerned and I cared. Um, so I launched a project called uh, Home Street Home. And essentially what this is, is this is found cardboard. These are hand-stitched signs, and then they're framed, and they're hung in San Francisco. And so what I was doing was basically going around and installing these at places where people were sleeping. And the idea here is not that I'm solving homelessness, because actually it's a very sort of controversial and contentious issue in San Francisco about how to deal with the homelessness problem. Um, but really, so that 
average people that walk by people sleeping on the street every day take that second glance. You know, they, they walk by and they do the double take, what was that? And just make them realize and think about for a second that, yeah, that person's actually sleeping on a curb and that must suck. The idea being to build a little bit more awareness and empathy, um, but I don't pretend to have the uh, solution to this prob problem. Um, I'm also inspired by emotion. Um, in this particular project, uh, it was 2004, so my emotion at the time was frustration, anger, probably anger and frustration at the same time. And uh, the only way I can introduce this project is to say that it's usually the one in the presentation that makes you want to buy me a beer afterwards or kick me in the throat. Um, so essentially what it is, is little yellow flags with uh, President then President uh, Bush's face on them that were inserted into uh, dog feces that was left on the streets. So um, basically I started doing this around San Francisco because some people just don't clean up after their dogs and um, then <laughs> put the photos on the internet. And so what happened with this was really interesting because um, there's no, yeah, I know. <laughs> There's no URL attached to this. It's a purely experiential uh, moment where you walk across this, you see it, and you either laugh or you think that's disgusting or you get angry. But it's just an emotional response to what you're seeing. And um, it also makes you realize how many people don't clean up after themselves. Um, so the thing with this is that I, I obviously put, this, put some of these photos online and made templates available and people started downloading them and making their own and sending me photos. And it became this sort of internet, um, one of those viral things that goes around. It was, uh, had over, it had millions of page views, was written about in several magazines, ended up on TV in the UK. And uh, you know, it's one of these things where uh, you've all, this is, this is the last one, don't worry. Um, <laughs> You've all stepped in dog poop before, right? You've had that moment where you're like, oh, and then you're kind of looking at your shoe, and you go and you find something to clean it off. You wipe it on the grass, you get a stick, and you use the stick in the grooves, right? And you wipe it on the grass more. You get it home, you put the hose on it. But somehow, the next time you put on those shoes, they're still kind of ruined, right? And that's exactly how I felt about the Bush presidency. Um, what's, what's interesting is, is that I can't claim that this this influenced anyone, but I did catch this on South Park um, and thought that maybe they had seen, seen something similar. It was in the Harley Davidson episode, I don't, Little Yellow Flags. Um, so I do realize that when you start something like this, that you're going to make about 50% of the country laugh and you're going to make the other 50% of the country want to kick your ass. And so I actually had my um, physical mailing address on the website to send self-addressed stamped envelopes so I could send you flags and stuff. Um, and I kept expecting someone to just knock on my, warn my door one day and just clock me. But it never happened. Um, but I did get some interesting emails from folks. <laughs> and my personal favorite email of all time That's all it said. Um, so I've, I've presented this twice in Texas and nobody's beaten me up, so I think that's a pretty good sign. Um, but I was at Creative Summit there and there was a bunch of different speakers for the conference and uh, one of them was a creative director from Nike and we became friends and it's a multi-day thing so we hung out. She's from there, we had lunch with her parents and all this stuff. And sort of at the closing party, she's like, you know Brian, I didn't have the heart to tell you earlier but my parents are close personal friends of the Bushes, and they didn't like your presentation. And I was like, yeah, well, what can I say? But they understood, I think. Um, so if there's anything you're familiar with about uh, the work that I've done, uh, it's probably the Thousand Journals Project. This is the one that's sort of gone the farthest and is the most widely known. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's a thousand blank journals that I sent out into the world. People who got them were supposed to add something to them, writing, drawing, photography, anything they wanted. But the idea was that they take these journals and then pass them on in this sort of ongoing collaborative art form. Um, and when speaking about the project, it makes sense to start at the beginning. Where did the inspiration come from, right? Well, it came from bathroom walls. Uh, when I was in college in, at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, the art department shared a building with ROTC. And it was this sort of L-shaped building. 
And right at the, at the, where the L, the, the, I don't know, what's that called? I'm a typographer, I should know this shit. Um, you know, that part where the, the, the building met, that was where the glass blowing lab was. But there was also a bathroom there, which was where people went when they needed to spend a little time alone. Um, they also brought their Sharpies and things. So people would write on these walls um, about drugs and war and sex and pretty much everything you could possibly think of. And oftentimes it was things that you, you'd think they wouldn't be comfortable saying this to their friends. You know? So I was very intrigued by this and uh, while I was in college I photographed some of it. When I graduated I uh, started frequenting bar bathrooms. I went to like UC Santa Cruz and UC Berkeley, walked to their campuses, photographed their bathrooms, trying to collect these little things that people had written on the walls. And also amazed at how many people bring Sharpies into the bathroom. Um, so I started thinking about what to do with all these photographs and you know you have to remember this is before blogging and you know the internet's really popular so I thought, well, it'd be, make a great like coffee table book or something. And wouldn't it be great if this book had, uh, had the ability for you to add your own entry, continue the conversation? And I thought, well, why do you need the photos? Why don't people just write? And why aren't there a lot of them? And why don't they travel? So it was literally June 17th of 2000. Um, I remember because I actually wrote it down that day. I was, I was walking from work to the bus. And it was like one of those moments of the cartoons where the, uh, the little flash bulb thing goes off, the little, it literally went off and I stopped in my tracks and it had been five years since I'd graduated college and the light bulb finally went off. This is what I have to do. So it was literally six weeks later that uh, I launched the project. Um, at the time, I had no idea what I was doing, no idea. I knew I needed some journals and I needed a website. Journals, kind of the easy part, I'm a, I'm a graphic designer. Um, to put this in context, um, up here in the corner, that's, that's a door. This is a little area rug. My bed is right here. And uh, there's a desk right here. This was literally launched from my bedroom floor, a little 10 by 10 uh, bedroom in Coal Valley. And I know it looks huge up on the screen, but this is bigger than it was in real life. The bedroom's much smaller than that. Um, so journal covers, again, the easy part. I designed a lot of the first covers. There is uh, 100 different covers for 1,000 journals, 10 covers, or 10 journals for each cover. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to get the help of some uh, both known and unknown artists and designers from around the world. Uh, Amy Francesini from Future Farmers, Gary Baseman, Claire Robertson from Australia, Cody Hudson, Craig Frazier, Gary Taxale, Linda Zack. Sort of the list goes on and on of people who were kind enough to contribute covers to the project. Toki Doki, Rick Valicenti, and so forth. The, uh, the other part of the equation was a website. And it's always funny to look at the original website because this is what I launched. Um, it was essentially a grid of numbers. You click on the number, you see the journal. Um, over time, the website's gone through a lot of uh, revisions uh, to including more information, more of a news feed, more updates. Um, now it primarily exists as a uh, sort of a, a way to browse through the journals, what people have added to them. But to skip back to that year, and uh, that month in 2000, November, um, I launched the Thousand Journals project with 100 journals. I bought the first 100, put covers on them, stamped the insides, numbered them, wrote instructions, and I began distribu distributing them in San Francisco. I left them at bar bathrooms, I left them on park benches, um, on public transit. Um, basically, I was taking the Johnny Appleseed approach. I was gonna go and I was gonna plant all these seeds, message in a bottle, and see what happens. My original plan was that I was going to launch 100 journals in 10 major cities around the world. Then I'd fly to Tokyo and do 100 there and fly to Sydney and do 100 there. That was my, my pipe dream. Um, turns out after I got the first 100 journals out, I realized this is the world travel thing, not going to happen, and that I needed some help. So the website had begun to get a little bit of traffic and people started emailing me saying, hey, I'd love to participate. So I think, great, here's how you can do it. I found 10 people from 10 different cities around the world and I sent each of them 10 journals. So the second set of 100 journals went out to 10 different people and they were responsible for distributing those in their city. Uh, Belgium, London, New York, LA, and so forth. So now I had like my minions helping me out. Problem was by the time 200 journals were out, the website started getting linked to by a lot of those early design blogs. Design is kinky, take K10K and all those types of folks. So emails and traffic start growing. And I think people are sending me these arguments about well, I teach, I've got all these art students, I'd love to share it. I've been keeping journals for 15 years. And I'm thinking, I don't want to go through all of these and try to determine who deserves a journal and who doesn't. So I'll just send a journal to anyone who asks. 
Make it easy. That worked for a little while until there's too many emails. I think, well, what am I going to do about this? Genius that I am, I think, we'll just put a sign-up feature on the website. That'll be easy. So I enlist the help of a developer, um, and it takes us a while to actually get this thing working, get the database and the sign-up feature working. But he, um, he helps me build it, and we're ready to launch the sign-up feature. 700 journals have already been sent out in the world, so they're floating around doing their thing. Uh, we have 300 journals left to hand out. We launch the sign-up feature, 17,000 people sign up. So really all it did was make a lot of people frustrated. A uh, complete lesson in supply and demand. Um, but what you're seeing here is sort of a collection of some of what people have put in the journals. Um, it's usually about 50% writing, 50% uh, artwork. And I tend to skew it a little heavy towards the artwork because it's flashing by real quick and you can't really read what they wrote anyway. Um, I do think, however, that uh, what people have done with the journals is probably the most interesting part. Um, once they leave my hand and they either, they're either found, someone discovers them on a park bench, or you know, they're sent to somebody in Wisconsin who takes it, adds something to it, and they leave it on a park bench, what do people do with the journals then? Well, that's where stuff starts getting fun. Um, journals have been left in the lost and found. They've been hidden in caves. There's a place called Enchanted Rock in Texas, and apparently you hike up this big hill to Enchanted Rock. And uh, a woman took a journal. She hid it in the cave at the end of the hike with a, in a Ziploc bag with a Sharpie. And so for a while, people would send in, send in sightings to the site saying, oh, hey, hiked up to Enchanted Rock, found this journal. We wrote some stories, drew some pictures. Awesome. And then eventually you get this email from someone saying, hey, I hiked to Enchanted Rock, looked in the cave, there was no journal. What happened? Well, somebody obviously took it. Um, they were abandoned at airports. This is pre-9-11. They were used on treasure hunts. And they were stolen at gunpoint. In all fairness, the, one that, the, the woman that got mugged just happened to have the journal in her bag. Um, I don't think the mugger was going for the journal. Um, but I do have this fantasy that that journal will turn up someday and there'll be like an entry in it saying, like, I mugged this woman and all I got was $7 in this crappy journal. Um, <laughs> Um, there are some funny stories, though, that have sort of surfaced from um, both what people have done with the journals and what they've entered into them. And in Journal 587, I like to call this the apology because if you read through the entry, you can sort of get the gist of it. And it's, it's kind of long and drawn out, but this guy added this entry with photos and so forth. But essentially what he did is he, he, he's writing an apology to a friend. And he sums it up in what he um, added to the website, which I'll, I'll read to you. Um, it was given to me in Brooklyn. I then left for Arizona with my girlfriend. Me and the woman are no more, but I finished my part of the journal. I'm now sending it to a friend that I hurt so much, he's no longer my friend. And I'm thinking, wow, that's, that's some powerful stuff. I mean, I just sort of float these journals out in the world, and this person's using this, this artifact as like a vessel of apology, mending a broken friendship. I mean, that's, that's powerful stuff. And then I see the next entry. It came wrapped in white computer paper bearing my name without postage, and I knew immediately it was from Josh. That asshole who had already forgiven for ruining our friendship, but was still not going to waver in my decision to tell him to fuck off. So apology not accepted. <laughs> um, I also view these journals as, as sort of like a, a time capsule or like a window into other people's lives. Um, because people of all ages have handled the journals, from the elderly to the young. And uh, in Journal 912, there's an entry um, that just really sort of brought me back to high school. And it goes, uh, I wash dishes at a restaurant. I smoke pot every day. I'm 18 years old. I'm a senior in high school. I've been dating the same girl for 10 months. I've been sleeping with her for nine. Every day I dream of fortunes and riches, life without complications or responsibility. My friends are all addicted to meth. It is refreshing to see something like this in my town, a vague monument of creativeness and individuality. Maybe the banana peel wouldn't be so bitter if God wasn't so oblivious. And I read that and I think, man, that brings me back to high school, like those teenage angst years you know, that I pretty much blacked out of my memory because high school sucked so bad. Um, but I do think that when I was in high school, I knew how to spell. Um, <laughs> so I hope this guy's still not working at a restaurant. Um, and then in Journal 995, there's an entry. And, and this one is, is the single entry that I uh, really, really wanted to include in the book. And it's also the single entry that Chronicle Books picked out and said, we will not publish this. Um, I received permission from its author, 
but when Chronicle sort of explains the complications and the names and the photos and all this stuff, I, I kind of get it. But what it is, is it's a um, account of a woman's life and it's written in the perspective of a split personality. Dear me, it's good to talk to you again, it's been a while, that kind of thing. And uh, she starts in her early childhood and then as you read through her entry, it goes across several pages. You get to the part in high school where the split happened. And I'm, I'm just gonna read it to you, it's, it's a little bit heavy. Um, I remember him grabbing you and then him starting to take off your clothes. You try to stop him. He was too strong. He soon sat, had you on the floor, pinned. He shoved himself inside you, ripping and tearing you. It hurt so bad. I remember because I ended up there with you that night. That was the night that I lost you. He took not only you away, but many other things. He tore and tore inside you, laughed at us when we screamed for help, told you how ignorant you were. He wanted you to put your clothes back on, but all you could do was cry. He pulled you up from the floor with our hair caught on a table leg. A large chunk of hair stayed with the table leg. We kept crying and crying. Soon he said that if we told anyone, he would kill us, kill us dead. Only do what he did tonight again. He said he would rape us again. So out of all of the entries that I've seen in the journals, and there are a lot of entries, um, this one is the most powerful and most gut-wrenching and difficult to read through. But somehow at the same time, it's also uh, almost it, it, it exhibits so much courage that this woman would put this story into a journal that she knew was going out to the public, friends and or strangers, um, perhaps in the hope that you know, others who had read it, who would read it and maybe experience something similar would know that they're not alone. Um, so it strikes me as this is a sort of uh, testament to the human condition and our ability to deal with and move on um, and how much bravery she had. And, and she had signed the paper. She was willing to have this put in a book and be published with her name on it. Um, and it does have a happy ending. She goes on to chronicle where she is in her life now, her new boyfriend, her new job, and so forth. So it does have a happy ending, but to this day still strikes me as one of those entries that just sucks the life out of you, um, but at the same time is somehow courageous. Um, on the flip side is Journal 354, The Pirate's Tale. So again, when starting a project like this, um, you get a lot of emails from folks. And it turns out that there's just a lot of crazy people in the world. Like, I get so much weird email from folks that, uh, you know, I can't even begin to describe it. So when I got the email that started out, my crew and I were headed down the Mississippi River on a pirate ship that we cleverly disguised as a river barge on our way out to sea, I'm thinking, delete, right? This thing's like this long, and it's all pirate speak, like the she blows. <laughs> but, but before Pirates of the Caribbean came out, so pirates aren't even cool yet. So I'm thinking, okay, crazy people crazy person, about ready to delete it. And I noticed the next email is from the same person, but it has attachments. Curiosity peaked. So I click on that to see what the attachments are. And it turns out they're Polaroids of people dressed as pirates <laughs> with a journal running around St. Louis. So what it was, was uh, the email was essentially a treasure hunt, giving you clues as to where they hid the journal. And I've never been there, but apparently there's a park full of giant statues and they hid it in the giant turtle statue. So again, for weeks I was getting these emails. It's like, hey, I tracked down the giant turtle statue. I didn't find the journal. What happened? Uh, another journal missing in action. And then finally, journal 979 is the personals ad. And this is the only one I've done any Photoshop work to, um, primarily just for the delivery because it starts out to all you sexy ladies. Hi, my name is Jeff Chang. I'm five foot six and 19 years old. I'm also single and good looking. Underline twice. <laughs> I attended Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. My hobbies include art, video games, and J-pop music. If you are beautiful, then let's get together sometime. And he added a picture. Asian would be a plus, must be fun and easygoing. C cup required. <laughs> So this to me is just hilarious. So I, of course, get in contact with this guy and because uh, I wanted to use this image in the book and henceforth became friends with him on MySpace. Um, and so I would occasionally get updates from him. And the last one I received was, I'm just letting you know that I got another mail from MySpace asking me if I'm the Jeff Chang that posted up the personals ad in your Thousand Journals project. Unfortunately, it hasn't brought me any cute dates. <laughs> so I've got nothing on Match.com apparently. So. Where is the project today? Well, as I sort of mentioned earlier, there was a book published 
And it sort of uh, highlights a lot of the entries uh, that have been added from various journals. Still available, great holiday gift. Um, and you know you've really made it when your book ends up on the desk in a like two second scene in Parks and Recreation. I was getting text messages. They're like, I saw your book. It was sitting right on top of Spec. <laughs> Spec's also a very good book. Um, on top of the book, um, in 2005, I was contacted by a filmmaker from Los Angeles, Andrea Kreuzhog, and she said, I'm fascinated with this project. I didn't sleep last night. I've gone through the entire website, and I think there's a movie here. And I'm a little bit skeptical about that kind of stuff. So I said, I don't see the character arcs, the conflict, the resolution. I don't, I don't see the movie. Um, but she convinced me that she thought there was a, a documentary here. So I gave her permission, and she spent the next year doing research, tried to track down every single journal, spent the following year filming, and I forget how many countries, but she traveled the world tracking down these people, and then spent a year just in production. So uh, it's on Netflix, and uh, you can get it on Amazon, I believe. Um, it did the whole film festival circuit for a while, but what I discovered, because you know, when this is happening, I'm like, ah, this is going to be released in theaters. It's going to be awesome. Um, turns out that there's something like 1,000 documentaries produced in America every year, and maybe 10 of them get a theatrical lease, and three of them make money. So the statistics are kind of stacked against you. So um, you can check that out. And then um, it also ended up being a, an exhibition, which was a surprise, not something that I'd even really considered, not that I'd considered it being a movie either. Um, but uh, the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles hosted a show, and uh, it was kind of fun to go down and check out. They have a beautiful uh, facility there, and so they had a lot of the artwork on display, journals for people to add to. And then the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art also did an exhibition of it. And what was great about working with SFMOMA um, is that you know my it was the first show, first exhibition, and I said, look, um, these things can't be behind protected glass. People can't put on gloves. They have to be open and available. So they were totally easy to work with. Um, we did like large, these long walls where they have these little kiosks sitting out and uh, you'd open the drawer, there'd be art supplies and you'd be encouraged to add to the project while it was there. Which um, was a great idea until they were like cleaning stuff off the walls every night because people would also draw on the walls. Um, and my genius idea was I'm like, we should do you know, exhibition signage, right? We should just do a bunch of journals. I'll pencil in the typography. People can fill it in on their own, it'll be great. So it sort of started out that way, and then it turned into that, and then it turned into that, and then that's what happened, which, I mean, I think that's awesome. Uh, doesn't really function as exhibition signage. They weren't very pleased with it, but I, I thought this was awesome. Um, they also had an area where you could, uh, uh, tables set up with art supplies where families and such could uh, sit and actually do journaling activities. Um, so the other great thing about working with a museum um, and also having a uh, sort of a design practice is getting to do the, um, the announcements. Um, turns out because there was a major show going on, they wouldn't produce a poster, which is what you think, like I'm gonna get a poster for my exhibition. And they said, well, we can't do two posters and have them up in cafes around the city in the same time, so why don't you do, we've got a great idea, you can do like a bookmark, and we'll put the bookmarks next to all those stacks of postcards you see in the coffee shops and everything. I was like, I don't think that's going to work very well. Um, how about you tell me what your print budget is and I'll figure the rest of it out. So what we did is we created these and what they are are um, six different pieces of artwork from journals that are four color printed onto labels. Um, those labels are then um, tipped into a blind deboss that has uh, the SFMOMA logo and the deboss. They're offset printed on one side. Um, we drink a lot of Red Bull. And then uh, these things get stacked. They're screen printed, um, four different designs, so it ends up being something like 24 different variations of this. Um, and then they're hand sewn and check marked. So it turns out to be these like fairly insane um, production method. But these things we we drop them at cafes and they disappear that day. And I actually was at a party once and someone had one in there like on their fridge. So you know it works when you know, they're not sitting in the cafe, people are picking them up, and that people don't throw them away. And we sort of released them over time, so like one week we hit up 20 cafes with, you know, one design and then came back two weeks later with the next. So the other thing that happened with the project is that after all the journals were out, um, I'd get emails from folks saying, well, why don't you release a thousand more? Why don't you release five thousand? Why don't you do ten thousand? And this whole thing was self-funded. This is, this is me, like, 
using my retirement and having shitty furniture so I could buy journals. And uh, I thought, no, that's not going to work. But eventually I was sort of talked into launching 1001 Journals. And what this is, is this is just simply a website that allows you to launch your own journals project. You can launch a traveling journal that travels from person to person, location journal that stays at a specific location, or a personal journal, which is like your sketchbook. You just want to share what you've been adding to it. And this has been going on for a while. Um, and you know, there's like, I think at the time, the screenshot, 15,000 images. So it has way more images and way more journals than 1,000 journals ever did. Um, and a higher participation rate simply because it's newer. And you have to remember in 2000, people weren't you know, telling you where they were every moment of the day you know, with Facebook updates. Um, but you know, it, it had been going on and it was fairly successful. And then I get a call from um, someone from UCSF Children's Hospital and they're applying for a grant. And they want to launch journals in the hospital setting and they want me to endorse it. Sure, no problem. I endorse it, they get the grant, and they're like, well, you, would you like to come to an event? I'm like, absolutely. Um, I don't do like journal events, like let me coach you on how to make your journal special, but I was happy to go you know, hang out with the kids and screen part of the documentary and talk with them. So I went to the hospital and I sort of gave a little presentation and then hung out while they were making their artwork. And if you've ever been to a children's hospital, then you can sort of sympathize with this, but literally your life changes. Um, I mean, it's kids at a hospital. I mean, there's, there's something so inherently wrong with that. Um, you know, these kids should be outside playing, not wearing masks and so forth. And so it's, it's, a, it's an emotional roller coaster, right? At the same time, the hospital staff are amazing. I mean, they are keeping the kids' spirits up, keeping the activities going, tending to them. I mean, it's just really, you know, people always talk about heroes in the world, and you're like, you see this, and you're like, okay, hospital staff working with kids, there's some real heroes for you. Um, but what happened this day was, um, you know, as this event was going on, at one point, I found myself cornered by um, hospital staff. Like I was standing there and they were in a, this half circle around me. And they were just firing stories at me. Like, oh, when this happened, no, what about this? And it was things from like kids with cystic fibrosis who can't be in the same room as other kids with cystic fibrosis, being able to write down their experiences in a journal and being able to communicate them to somebody else. So somebody who's got it can look at it and understand how other people are dealing with it. Yes, I'm not alone. Um, there was an instance of a teenage girl who was about to be released. Um, and she hadn't really interacted with the hospital staff much, but they gave her this journal. And <laughs> because it's a hospital and because they're minors, when you give someone a journal, it also comes with the parental consent form, the legal form. I mean, it's, it's kind of a lot of work. But she was disclosed as to this is a public journal. What you re enter will be shared, blah, blah, blah. She consented, signed the paper. Her parents consented, signed the paper, all that stuff. That's how much work you have to go through to add to a journal in a hospital. Um, but she, she wrote a bunch of stuff in the journal, and they got it, and they read it. And so then they gave it to her caregivers, and her caregivers read it. And then they approached her with the journal, and they said, hey, um, you know, we, we read what you wrote. And she's like, I know you would. And they're like, well, you know we can't release you, right? She's like, yeah. Um, she was suicidal, and she didn't know how to ask an adult stranger in a hospital for help. Didn't know how to, like, breach that barrier. Um, you know, and, and actually ask for help, but found safety in the journal as a form to communicate with them, like, I need help, I don't, you know, I'm having problems, I can put it in the journal, and you can help me. So it's actually, they actually altered what her treatment plan was based on this project. So, you know, you hear this stuff and you're just like, okay, we need to get this journal project into every hospital around the country, which um, we did spend like six months trying to do. And it turns out it's really, really hard. Um, mostly due to budgetary constraints and red tape. Every hospital has different uh, uh, rules about taking an object from one patient and giving it to another and what kind of sterilization has to happen in between and whether or not paper can be transmitted and whether or not a sticker is paper. You know, it's like it gets to the point where Phoenix Children's Hospital tried it and it kind of failed. We talked to Stanford, we talked to Oakland Children's Hospital, and so far UCSF's the only one who's been able to pull it off. Um, but that's sort of where it is at now. It's, it's, I think we're going to focus on small organizations, um, uh, at-risk youth organizations, elderly care, and so forth, where there's, I think, less sort of red tape to deal with. Um, but that's sort of where the project is now. Um, and to tie this back to the beginning of the presentation, I, I want to ask you again, sort of what inspires you? Because it's going to be different for everyone, um, and hopefully something you've seen tonight has sort of piqued some interest. Um, but I, I want to say this, and I want to say that um, you have ideas. 
I think anyone who works in the creative industry tends to be full of ideas. You write them down, I'm gonna, I want to start a screen printing company and make t-shirts. You know, whatever it might be, that was my idea in college, um, as is every college student's idea. Um, but you have these ideas. Um, when I started the journal project, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what would happen. It has reached 40 countries, been in every U.S. state. It's been written about in the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Wall Street Journal, uh, Entertainment Weekly, uh, Better Homes and Gardens. My mother loved that one. Um, um, it was made into a documentary. It was made into an exhibition. Um, it turned into a book. Um, but n there's no way I could have known any of this when I first came up with the idea. But I, I had the courage to take that first step. So if there's a final sort of parting thought I'll leave you with tonight, it's like you have those ideas. You're thinking of them right now, something that you've wanted to do outside of your professional work or outside of the office. Um, and I urge you to take that step because if you don't, um, if you don't take that step, if you don't make your ideas a reality, you know what happens, right? Nothing. Thank you. Mm. Oh, and if there is any questions. Yes, over here. Oh, um, it, it's funny because I, I get inspired by the strangest things. Like people always ask me which artists inspire me, and I'm for some reason inspired by like Christo and Warhol for the like Warhol for getting famous for doing kind of mediocre art, but was groundbreaking at the time, or Christo for just the scale at which he works. Um, but at the same time, the process-driven stuff, like there's something about at least the fine art that I do that is very monotonous and almost. Uh, soothing and somehow painful at the same time. Something about the suffering that goes along with sitting there and just, you know, some of those graphic panels have over 5,000 individual pieces of paper. You know, the Bible has, I think that version might have had like 1,500 pages where every line is just sort of knocked out. So there's something about that that I just think I'm attracted to. I think there's a lot of graphic designers that have OCD or are also anal retentive and maybe, uh, you know, have issues to deal with too. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know, I think you could walk down the street and be inspired by the strangest things, like the little grill plate, you know, um, and that just sparks an idea. Um, it just depends. Anyone else? Yes? On the journals, I was wondering how, oh. oh. On your journals, how many did you get back out of the original thousand, and how did people, did people send them, actually send them back? Well, um, yes and no. Um, I don't know, what do you think would be a good return rate? You send out a thousand journals, like what, like 50%? Five, you think five? Okay. Um, I have about 30 to 35 in my possession. And um, that sounds like a huge failure, right? Um, but you have to keep in mind that this was, this was launched when blogging was first becoming popular. Facebook didn't exist. People behavior online is much different now than it used to be. and the tracking of these things just was a complete flop. Like the first journal that returned had maybe five sightings online. But when you actually read through the journal, you could see that it had been to 13 US states, to Brazil and to Ireland, had touched, I, for, I don't know how many people. But people just weren't going online and writing about it. It wasn't, that just wasn't happening at that time, you know, 2001, 2002. Um, so I have about 35. Um, they were returned in various states of completion. So some were full, some were half full. I think the last one I got back uh, from Florida just showed up on my doorstep um, in an envelope and uh, no note and maybe 10 pages filled. It had been out for like 10 years and somebody just had it and probably felt guilty and just felt that they had to get it back to me. Um, so it just ranges. Um, my hope actually is that, you know, the longer they're out there, the better. You know, if one comes back 15 years from now, 20 years from now, I mean, how awesome will that be? Um, but yeah, I've, I've definitely had the question like, is, is 35 out of 1,000 successful? And I'm like, I don't know, it's just an experiment. Um, that's what happened. 
And uh, I think the side effect of it, the emails that I get from people saying, you know, I never got a journal, but this has inspired me to pick up my paints again or to start writing again. I mean, just knowing that that's like being reawakened in people. Um, there's, there's a, I think the trailer for the documentary, which I didn't show, has this, I, I sort of quote uh, Gordon McKenzie, and if you know who he is, he wrote a book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. And uh, he, I think he passed away a few years ago, but he was a creative director at Hallmark. And the book is essentially how to navigate the creative world in a business environment. And one of the um, points he brings up is, is that if you ask a room full of kindergartners, how many of you are artists? They'll all raise their hands. And you ask the same question to a bunch of sixth graders, how many of you are artists? And you'll get a few of them to raise your hands. And you ask a bunch of high school seniors, how many of you are artists? And you might get one or two to raise your hands. And so he's basically questioning what happens to our creativity as we grow up. We start to fear criticism. We start to learn that arts, artists are weird. You know, we start to shut down that part of our, our behavior. And uh, my hope is that the project in some way has sort of reawakened some of that in people because it's a shame to be, you know, stuck in traffic all day long when all you really want to do is create stuff. Anything else? So what's on the boilerplate? Like, what's the next idea that's doing in your brain? Um, I, I have been focusing a little more on the fine art lately. Um, there's a show opening next week in LA that'll have both the Love Evil Bible piece and the Knowledge and Wrath panels. Um, and I've submitted a few proposals for artist residencies. It's just, uh, I, we had talked earlier about, you know, the key to being happy in graphic design is to get rid of all your clients. Um, so <laughs> I think this might be the path. I don't know how it's going to work out, like, financially. <laughs> um, but it is one of those, you know, I enjoy problem solving for the, the companies that we do work for. Um, but there's something about dealing with the bureaucracy and, the, you know, designed by committee that just sort of gets you down. And I've been finding so much more joy in just making cool stuff, you know art, conceptual art, hopefully. Right, yes? Have any people in your design firm are they currently doing any projects like outside of the studio that are similar to yours or any? Oh, they're stuck make, helping me with my projects. <laughs> um, no, and, but actually um, the, the junior designer I have now, I hired because he had done that. Um, he had, as part of, I think, his senior thesis or something, he actually started his own um, film festival event, which was for the San Francisco Film Institute, which I think ended up partnering with him on this. But he, um, he did an event where he had um, famous movies shot in San Francisco. He had stills from them. And it was sort of like a treasure hunt. So you get this deck of cards, and you'd have to go find the location where this scene in this old famous movie um, took place. And there were maps, and you would take up, you would hold it exactly where it was for all these famous movies, and then take a photo. Um, it was called Reframe SF. Um, but the fact that he did this as a student and made it happen—it was an actual event. People paid like twenty-five dollars to participate, and he's got you know shots of it. I mean, people who can make that stuff happen—it's it's way more important to me than like showing me that you were able to you know, finesse a design to its utmost, you know, whatever. Um, you know, just having the initiative, uh, you know, to start it and to try it. And the truth is you're going to fail. I mean, if I got up here and just showed all the, you know, it was like six successful projects, sort of successful. Um, I could tell you the 25 projects that I've tried that have failed miserably, um, which might have actually been a more interesting talk. But, you know, you, you, you will fail lots of times, but every time you fail, you just have to learn from it and move on. Keep trying. Thank you so much. All right, thanks.